Good morning, I'm Tony Mauberger from the Redlands Daily Facts doing another installment of our video in interviews in uh, observance of the city's 125th anniversary. I'm here this morning at Fred Ford and Company where they're cutting firewood outside. It smells wonderful. And that's Ford as in Ford Park and Ford Street. Your family's been here a long time. Talk to me about, uh, about your family. Grandpa was our first um, person of the family to come here. And he um, had graduated from Penn State as a civil engineer and came out here to establish a trade. He loved Redlands. He'd heard a lot about it from some other people who I don't know who. Redlands was in a very developmental mode at that time. I mean, the Judson, and the Browns, and all the people were really into the development aspect of Redlands. What year was that? I cannot, in the late uh, 18, 1890 something, 91, 2, and okay. that, that, that vintage. And uh, he came out here and had tuberculosis. He had contracted it somewhere, which was a very prevalent disease in those days. And he went into a sanitarium down in Colton and spent some time there until he got rid of it. And uh, the Early best. 20s at this point. He was at his 22, 3, 4, somewhere in there. And. <laughs> The amazing part about it, the old man died at 96 years of age, and he was an absolute vegan. From the day one, he believed in the vegetarian way. He was not a Adventist. He was a Baptist. In fact, he's one of the three founders, co-founders of the, or tri-founders, as it would be, of the First Baptist Church, which is having its anniversary this year. Yeah. Um, we celebrated on November the 11th, which is two days from the actual birth. My granddad was one of the founders of that ch church, tri-founders, uh, Art Gregory and a person named Foote, who was uh, the great grand or the grandfather of a distinguished name that grew to be well known around well, the, the Zilk family, Z-I-L-C-H, I think. And um, anyway, he uh, died at 96. Every tooth that he developed in his adolescent age was still in his head. And he had every one of them. And I, there was no dental care as we know it today then. They were all, and they really were interested in what happened. But he, he, he lived a good life. He became, he was about five feet four and weighed about 120 pounds dripping wet. And he could run most of us into the ground. You learn to, my, my size came from my mother's side of the family. And my mother's side of the family came here in sometime in the late 1900s because my mother and her brothers were born here in the Reynolds area. And the, uh, my grandfather on my mother's side and my grandmother were, grandmother was a direct descendant descendant of William Brophy, who invented the cleft palate remedial procedure, the where you where you do an operation and eliminate the cleft palate, which has become still used by the way of my interest area of rotary. And he was the he was the primary plastic surgeon who developed the procedure. So your grandfather came here in the late eighteen hundreds yep. when he was in his early twenties. Right. And your so I presume your father was born here. My father was born in Redlands, as were his brothers that preceded him on a first marriage of my father. Actually I think we could track back into the eighteen eighties because uh, one of his dad's brothers was ten years older than he was and he was he and my mother were born right at the turn of the century. And you could always remember their age pretty easily because they were born then. So you back all that back up. And so I'm your not, mother's family also came here. Came here, yeah. and yeah, and Brophy had made so much money in the cleft palate surgery. My grand, great grandfather on my mother mother's side, that he. My my grandpa on my mother's side had different persuasions, um, of interested people. And we'll try to be as delicate as we can, but he was gay. That was all there was to it. He was a closet cave. You did, a closet gay. You didn't come out as we do this chair now. And he uh, went to Laguna Beach every year. They had a place down there right on the water on Woods Cove, one of the primary areas still in anywhere in the Pacific uh, Southwest. And they lived there, and he lived a good life. He was a musician. 
and thus the interest of my mother getting into music and all that kind of thing. And my dad, she was the oldest. She was a uh, girl with boy's interest in doing. She really, they, the, my great grandfather gave them a stipend, a sizable stipend, to put a citrus, plant citrus, because he had heard he lived in Chicago, in the Chicago area, how well citrus did in Redlands. And so he gave them enough money to grow and or plant and grow uh, some 40 acres of citrus and pick up another several three or four hundred acres of raw land in the back of the Bryn Mawr Hills and over Moreno Valley. Uh, this is an investment so they can be taken care of. And these were your parents? These No, these were my these were your grandparents. grandparents who were being taken care of. But and my mother got all of her working ability from my grandmother, who, who gave uh, Taft when he visited here and other presidents, whoever they were, orange juice up at Smiley Park. And that's, I remember that, hearing that bit of history. But on that side, my mother's side, there was, and all the families that were on my father's side, they all worked hard. They all were people of the soil, grew fruit, was, grew trees and tree fruits. And my dad became very successful at it, of the, all of the family members. I remember he was really the farmer of the group, or the rancher, or grove, whatever you want to take. Now, let me back you up. Yep. Your grandfather comes here as a civil engineer. Yes. And he's uh, battling tuberculosis. He becomes better probably in his mid-20s. Mm -hmm. And does what? Is he involved in... That's sketchy to me, Tony. Does he Tony, stay as a I, civil engineer? Or? Uh, no, he's always a civil engineer, but he's also a visionary, and he he would do things. He has probably one of his best known projects was for the Bear Valley Water Company while they were developing the Bear Valley Dam in the process. My granddad did a foot by foot incremental elevation survey in that lake, and he could tell them how much water they had stored by measuring the elevation of the lake. And nobody, it's still used up there. It's a map that they have up there. Unbelievable amount of work. And not like we have computers today. or They didn't have calculators. They're all done by slipstick and whatever else. But he did that. And he became really interested in runs. And I can't, it's, he got very involved, bought quite a bit of property or acquired property up I know where the Rutland's Country Club is. He gave part of that to some the University of Rutland's, which in turn sold it, I believe, to the Country Club. I don't know the lineage, but I don't know. And then he he was one of the very involved people in the founding of the University of Rutland. Uh, not as to, because he uh, he had his interest in other schools elsewhere, but he was very instrumental in it, and they have paid homage to him more than once. But he was the town's first city engineer, um, and he was more a visionary or a planner. And he he really was very good at having great uh, what do you want to call it ideas of what we could become. I think my first real thought with him when I was about seventeen or eighteen, before I'd actually. I graduated from school, was I talked to him one day, I said, how did all this happen, Grandpa? He said, uh, Fred, never forget that it takes lots of money to do what we have in Redlands. It doesn't grow on trees, and it doesn't just come out of the ground. It takes people who have somewhat, sometimes, scurrious backgrounds. Yeah. And, you know, for instance, the whites, the bulls. They were well known, but they dealt in leather, I think, of leather skins, and that's a very tough business. And it's known for it, even today it is. It's, and he said it takes that kind of money to do what we want to do in this town, to have all the things we do. The Kimberleys, I mean, the Kimberley paper empire was huge, still is, but it was, and he didn't get there because he was a nice man. He got there because he was a businessman who had some pretty strong ways of how he was going to do business and he was very dominant in his field and that takes some pretty strong personalities to be that way and that was a good lesson learned early for me 
because I thought people just wrote checks, you know. And it, it amazes me still to this day some of the best things we have from some of the biggest surprises of gifts and how they'll turn out from their modest beginnings to what they are today in their lives or so forth. And they remember the community. And uh, we won't talk about names, but another distinguished family in town and very modest, started very modestly in an agriculture enterprise and the rest is history. So he and then his cousin came out, or a cousin of the family, Barley Ford, of who Ford Street was named. And Barley was one of the town's first bankers. I can't tell you the lineage exactly. Probably ought to know more, but you know, it's what's important to you today. <laughs> and that's my life, the way I look at things. So um, I could tell you a lot more, and there's a lot more to be told, but he. He loved the town, and on his gravestone, keep Re it says, "Keep Redlands beautiful," oh. and that was his saying. At he was hills at Hillside, and the family plots are up there. Mm -hmm. And um, he spent hours planning streets and doing things. And he built. Um, I mean, he saw to it. If you notice, everybody has said, "Why do the streets run diagonally? They don't." parallel the baseline, which by the way, I think at one of his very early jobs in the late 18, in the 1800s was survey, helping be a part of the survey crew for the establish the baseline, which they built a big fire up on top of Mount San Bernardino and they surveyed it down in Claremont. And they were able to see that fire through those scopes or whatever they did and they meant that's what the baseline and thus they the baseline. But the streets in Redlands don't parallel that. They go kind of diagonally. Well, there's a very good reason for it. Very simple. Horses were the vogue at the time when the streets were established. And you could pull a trolley with one horse on a level plane. When you had to go up Cajon Center and some of the others, you needed a team to pull them up. And that was when the horses were the vogue before the automobile came. But of course, he saw the idea, and his idea was very early that they would become parkways in the center with Thusley Brookside. And some of the other streets were parkwayed at a time and then got paved over and lost. But he was a, he established the first tree planting code in Redlands. And that was where he did, he actually figured out the trees that would survive and do well here. And interestingly enough, in this day and age, redwoods were not one of them. And we see all the hullabaloo over the redwoods. I kind of am amused about it. I have one sitting out here in the front. It's about 30 years old, and it's just working like the devil to get to be 100 and die. Because redwoods and that type of tree are not meant for this climate. And, and all the hullabaloo over the removal mm -hmm. and all that, they were destined to die on that street. And another, I haven't only knows, but I know trees I make a living uh -huh. Knowing something about them, Tony. So, but you run a firewood business. I run a firewood business, which is the outgrowth of me going to Oregon State and meeting my bride of 53 some odd plus years, knowing her for 56 now, and um, she was the daughter of a very prominent lumberman in the Oregon area. She grew up in Eastern Oregon, Bend was where she was born, a little town called Redmond. And there was big sawmills, some of the most beautiful ponderosa pine that you've ever seen in your life was cut out. I have books here of that. It's unbelievable. We had a, at the turn of the, prior to the turn of the century, we had a wonderful pine, um, what do I want to say, forest that was down probably at least 500 feet lower than it is today. I've seen the change in my lifetime because of the global warming effect, where the tree levels of various kinds of trees have moved up the hill three to 500 feet simply because they uh, of the warming and they, they weren't made there. And a lot of people don't like redwoods are not built to live at 100 feet in the southwest. The thing that kills them here is photoperiosity. We had a tremendous, which is the length of sunlight. Mm -hmm. We had a tremendous amount of cedars and redwoods, particularly cedars, that were planted up at Hillside. Everybody thought they'd be great. They all died within about 80, 90 years of their 
because they just could they never had a time to rest, which all, every tree has to, and regenerate itself or cell-wise and all those kinds of things. I won't get into all the botany of it, but bottom line was that they never had those type of trees because there was so much sunlight here. They just grew and grew and grew and they burned out. That's the truth of it. At the higher elevations, we had incense cedar, which is a mimic somewhat. It looks a lot like a uh, redwood. It's different. The bark is very thick, fire resistant, and the wood is very resistant to, to insects. And then you have pine. Our pine forest up here was one of the finest in the world anywhere at one time. But what happened to it? We cut them all down to crate oranges to make crates, yeah. believe it or not. Probably some of the finest pine anywhere in the world came from within 200 miles of here and went into making orange crates which went around the world because they were all made out of, not cardboard, but wood. Yeah. yeah. Uh, a fact that kind of is interesting. That's really. great stuff. Well, it's, it's different, you know, and it's sort of a perspective. And of course, in most of these older buildings like this one here, we have true dimension lumber. And most of it is pine that was taken from the local forest. I had looked at one time at fooling around cutting pine for them at True Dimension for the historical people who wanted to restore okay. houses, uh, but use True Dimension timber. You know, a two by four is two by four inches, obviously, as you may know. It's a th one and a three quarters versus whatever else it is, and, and that's what a true two by, a two by four is. Uh, and so a True Dimension two by four is not two by four, it is less than that because they mill them down to clean them up and use less lumber, same value. Anyhow, so that's you became, you got interested in this because your wife's father, well, what did you Well, father? there was a little thing in my life, Tony, that happened. I got recruited by Oregon State University College then mm -hmm. to go play football. I wanted to be an ag teacher and they had a wonderful ag program. And bottom line was, I was recruited, and my father and mother wanted me to be a school teacher because they felt that was what they did to get the ranches going. Your parents were school teachers? In For a period of time, my dad was, no, not in Reynolds, he was up in Fillmore, uh, where they, in fact, he got out of town, came home to Reynolds to his, he had, far, he had trees growing in Ukaipa, in the Dunlap area, you know, where the Dunlap mm -hmm. School, all that. My father owned all of that at one time, down 160 acres, he and his brother. And they became very successful at raising stone fruits like uh, plums, peaches, and so forth, and walnuts, and growing, they had 40 acres of tomatoes. And I never forget the first time I ever saw a tomato fight with amongst kids. He had a whole group of high schoolers out there <laughs> <laughs> and they got in a tomato fight, and wow. everything stopped. And, and my dad just said, "You might as well watch it." He called me because it was funny. I mean, uh -huh. it was really fun. I mean, here was his crop going up and hitting the other people. But he said, "I just want to watch this." But my dad had a real imagination and a sense of humor. And he went to he graduated from Rollins High School as did my mother in 1920 1918. Uh, he went to Princeton. She went to Pomona, become a physician. He went to Princeton at, with some help from the family. There were, on my dad's side of the family was quite well to do in the mid, in the far, in the mid eastern part of the country, and they got him there. And in fact, his next door neighbor was Adley Stevenson, a candidate oh for the president God. of the United States. And the one on the other side was Harvey Firestone, Firestone Rubber yeah. Tire and Rubber. Yeah. And yeah, that was when Princeton was what we think of an Ivy League school. He graduated from there. He came to the U of R for some reason. I can't tell you why. I think it was prior to going to Princeton. He was at the U of R for a very brief time because he'd been drafted for World War I. And ironically, later on, it was to prove to be a little bit of a help to the death of his death because as a veteran of 61 days, <laughs> he qualified as a vet in all the perks. And when he was buried, uh, they paid for the headstone and all the stuff. And that, that happened later. But I was recruited to go to Oregon State and got up there my first quarter 
a classmate, a high school friend of mine went. We went together. And we were there. We loved it. I really was doing well. I had had a nice, se good season playing football. Playing football. I'd been asked to come back and by the present, by the coach that recruited me, and I told him I would definitely. And just before I was to come home for Christmas, uh, they had recruited a coach named Tom Prothrow, who became very well known. And he, he had called me in to say, and this story is a little out of sync, but I want to tell it, to say that I will too extend it. If you want to stay, you agree to stay with me four years, you have a full ride. Wow. Um, I would have been a pine brother. Uh, I don't know how much I would have paid, played. But, you know, anyway, I thought that was great. Five days later, I was walking back to the dorm, getting ready to come back to see my parents for the Christmas holiday. Um, and here comes the dorm mother and my best friend. He's a mess, and she's got tears. And I said, what's wrong? And she said, well, there's been a problem at home. Now, the first quote I thought that went through my mind, it was my mother. She had a congenitally weak heart, which I ended up inheriting, but I lived with it far longer than she did, and she, because she, but she was teaching school, and she was a music teacher by trade, and the spinet and revelings, you know, all the mm -hmm. things there, so I'm supposed to do what you're doing. I know. <laughs> and, and, and I will sooner or later, count on it. <laughs> we'll probably have a tsunami here in the room before it's all over with, but anyway. She, you were a the, freshman. I was a freshman. I just finished a very successful quarter, first quarter, and I loved the school. And, you know, rain all the time didn't bother me. It was just good. It was, school was good for me. I got away from home, felt good about it. Anyway, bottom line, she said, no, it's your dad. And my dad had been killed that morning in an auto accident on Oakland Road, going up to Oakland to play, pay the men. So he and my mother could come into Los Angeles at the airport to pick me up. They were going to spend the night before on a, on a anniversary delay uh, because they were married. In, in fact, they were married in the little brick church on in Baptist, back to the Baptist, that little Mexican church there that's very much, it's a Christian church just, oh, I don't know the name of the street. I can go there by it every day, <laughs> but there's a little little church, uh, something conception. Oh, yeah, over yeah. on, is it on Clark and Yeah, they were born there, yeah, they're, they, that's where they were married. And they were married in August, and so, but that was getting, that was harvest time on something. <laughs> and so we, anyway, and I had grown up, in fact, there's a little interesting story. We raised, boy, my dad had a knack to know when to do something for, for he just knew what to plant. There's an old saying in farming, plant bad seed. You plant something else that nobody else has and yeah. you'll make a good money. And during the war years, they, did, they got cuttings from Walter Knott and planted boysenberries up in Oak Glen at a 5,000 feet elevation. Well, the darn things wouldn't get ripe until the 1st of August. Everybody else was out of them. So my mother would drive, my dad couldn't see real well, he had some eye problems. And, and my, so my mother, they took, uh, an old Chevy car that we had made an Oklahoma pickup out of it by putting it, because you couldn't get things in the war. You couldn't get vehicles in the war to drive. And they, they, they would take the boysenberries. She would four times a week down in the LA market and sell them on the market. And the, a, a, a war bureaucracy came up and set prices and told her, she told my dad and mother they couldn't do that anymore. They were getting way too much money. So by God, she went downtown here in Redlands and sold them on the street corner for a couple of years. It did very well. It's all cash. I don't know the rest. But, uh -huh. but they sold it in the middle of summer. My dad had planned out his entire agrarian life. Uh, to know, always have a crop you're picking. Yeah. Like in the middle of the winter, it was navel oranges. In the spring, it was crops up in the Ukaipa area, the, 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 the tree, you know plums, peaches, and so forth, cherries. And in the summertime, in the late summer, it was blench oranges. 
and it was berries. And then in the fall, it was apples, a New Glen thing. And we were kind of like, it was kind of interesting. I lived in a freight car because my family couldn't, nobody could buy lumber to build a cabin up in Oak Glen with no electricity, an outhouse, and light by kerosene for four, three or four years of my life. Really? My sister and I and our little family out there in Oak Glen. And we, during the berry season, some of Redland's very best, Dr. Harold Hill, others that I could name, picked berries on that little place in the middle of the summer to earn some extra money. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable stories, but just, you know, those are the kinds of things. So, um, back to college. So he was headed to Oakland. He was headed up Oakland Road and real foggy. He was in a brand new car. They'd had a great year and evidently he bought a brand new car. They, we had bought a brand new car so that their son could drive pretty young girls to the formal carrots in a real nice truck, car because we had a 37 Chevy and that was all you could get and a something pickup. So he bought that So that in high school. It was a 53. We bought it from Langan Runkle here in Redlands. Mm -hmm. And my family bought the second car they ever sold, believe it or not, there. I don't know who bought the first one. But anyway, bottom line is he was driving up there and it was a foggy day and he had his head trying to see out the window a little bit. Truck came down with an overhang and didn't see him, and that was instant. It was gone. <laughs> so. How old was your mom? She was 54. They had us when they were 34 and 37, my, me and 34. But there's a couple of ironies to the story. My granddad had run a huge debt at that time on the Apple Ranch in Oakland, the snow line. He ran a little, what we called CCC Corps. He had all these people in his workforce all winter. And he got it, he ran up a $50,000 debt on the ranch in 1932, 33, right at the height of the depression. My dad, meanwhile, was making money, doing quite well, and it was a success story at the bank and worked his arse off, I mean, but, and my mother and father became a team. They married in 34. And Dan McLeod, whose name you'll see in the history as you go along here, who was one of the real great bankers that Redlands had. You could do a whole series on business people and commerce by itself, Tony. But great banker called my dad in and he said, Harold, uh, I'm either going to have to repossess the ranch from your father or I want you to take it over. I'll give you a 20% 20 year half a percent loan if and we'll let you pay it off. 8 days before he was killed, he paid the last. But and your grandfather didn't outlive. Him. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, my granddad outlived several two wives. Uh my dad was born in the second wife marriage, Pauline, and a brother, who he was my namesake, who died of all things of peritonitis of a burst of expense in 1935 or something, just before I was born. Uh, I was born in 36. So, so but. Outlived two of his children. Yeah. Well, I'm trying to, I don't know. There were several others that didn't make it very well, um, and I can't tell you much. I don't know much about the history of that side of the family. But he, anyway, just my dad and mother uh, were resolved people, and so was I. Two weeks later, guess where I was? Oregon State University. I was called in by Coach Brothrow and said, Fred, we know the problem, but We'll stand behind that offer no matter what. We want you to continue your schooling here and we'll give you four years of our money. Tuition, that was expensive. I mean, then it was, a, it was like $10,000 a year, but I had a full-time job when I left. Uh, not a full-time, but a good job. It was like dusting films. And the, mm -hmm. But it was a typical non-AC, 
In those days, the NCAA didn't have anything to do with investigations and all that. So you could, you know, and as your years grew, you got bump rights and you could do neat things. And But I had to tell him and look at him. I knew my mother couldn't handle We, my dad and I, had cleared below, right across from where Law's Coffee Shop is now, approximately, and my mother had been a part of it, of course, uh, had cleared about, oh, I know, 30 acres or so of land in a slope. Law's Coffee Shop? Yeah, or, or, the snow line is up at the top of the hill, and I, there's a whole bit of history there. But oh, in Oakland? Oakland, and, but at, right across from Law's Coffee Shop, my dad and I and uh, my mother, whatever, they decided to put in their own apples and divorce or get a, get out of the family thing. Mm -hmm. I have no idea why my dad saved the whole family without the gratitude that he got, should have ever gotten, and the care of my mother afterwards, which, but I think they knew. My uncle, who was a, was a very sharp businessman, Pretty well knew, I think, my dad that was going to come back and say, now I'm going to go back and borrow all that money again from the bank and I'm going to buy you all out. That was my guess. But, um, and they wanted me to teach school, which I, when I got married and came home after the service, just a short time in the service, I was a ROTC commissioned officer and paid a long time in the reserve, but never got called up. Uh, bottom line is all those things being what they are. Um, I told Coach Prosper that I could not take it in good faith because I knew that I probably would be coming home uh, to look help my mom make it. And sure enough, I did, twice. And I knew then that you know, I just knew right afterwards I went back, I was kind of going to go home at least once or twice. And it probably would be in the fall season because we had all this fruit to harvest and it was just a hectic time. And uh, so, uh, and I did twice. Uh, it, um, but um, it's why I have not, I don't quit, Tony. Uh -huh. It's just. I, now, um, you so have grandchildren here. I have grandchildren. So they are. I, they range 23 down to 10 years old. Fifth uh, generation? Fifth generation Fords. And uh, so, you know, and God knows I hope they behave themselves and we don't get a sixth one until we're ready. <laughs> but you never know. <laughs> In this society today. and. You know, uh, but and I. You were married to a school teacher. I was married to a. She no, she was. married to a former school teacher. She was a former teacher. You had a she class with her. Home ec teacher and, at the And she was, uh, uh, you know, she, she and I came. We moved to Yucaipa first. Newly married. But I spent the summer, for some reason, I didn't come home to work that summer. I had a fall job, my first teaching job. I had been doing substituting for some Redlands, Redlands in Yucaipa. And I knew I was gonna live in Yucaipa because that put me near the ranches. Mm -hmm. And I could go up there in the afternoon after school and change sprinklers or do whatever I had to do. And But I, you know, for some reason my heart wasn't in it. And I finally now know why. It's taken me God, I don't know how long to deal with it, and not just, I mean, people have known me over the last, maybe, oh, when I became an adult, 30 years plus, I always say, you're still a teenager until you turn 30 or more. I just really believe that. Of course, I, we, Barbara and I were 22 and 24 when we married. Oh, lived in Yucaipa. Our two daughters were born there, and I had been the chamber, of, the youngest chamber of commerce president at Yucaipa. Leadership and I were to have a destiny uh, because I, 
I was blessed for some reason with the ability to get people to do what I wanted to do. And, but it probably became clouded with anger. I was robbed. Yeah, sure. Sure. Uh, I'll never forget the bitter lesson that I learned. A very good friend, uh, not a friend, but an area person up there, one of the apple growers, whose truck had killed my dad, had his attorney send my mother a very strong letter, please don't consider suing us. And because we will fight it with everything. It was an accident. My mother said, you know, she called him up. She said, I would never sue anybody who knew my husband. And, uh, but, you know, that was the beginning of a, a lesson and our society is somewhat litigious and we sometimes, we are also selfish and we sometimes don't look at what we could do. And so, and my mother was a real tenacious, strong-minded person and she put both of us kids through school. We had some help from the scholarship community in Redlands, particularly the Van Marek family, helped my sister get through in the University of Redlands. And that was a great gift. And I worked my way through. Gosh, Tony, I loved every moment. Uh, I was a houseboy in a sorority. Oh. It was like putting a coyote in the quail oh, patch, you know. You know. <laughs> and I loved it. And my granddad was the same way. It's called the Ford Charm. I don't oh, think I got it? much of it, but but if I want to be decent, I could be pretty good at it, and I work at it sometimes. Uh -huh. But I married a lumberman's daughter um, this summer after I served in the service. We did our thing. Uh, I spent the summer working for my father-in-law at the sawmill, and I got to playing around with logs and sawdust and thought, this is pretty good. Anyway, I went to work at the mill. I learned how to handle logs, and I do. I love sawdust, and I love that smell that you I smell. Love the smell. And it's still so much a part of my life. And my father in law was a very dominant, strong willed person, and um, he reminded me of my granddad. My father in law was, in the sense of a Russia Aja story, he was orphaned when he was 14, and he and his brother. And they grew up, they never, I don't know whether they got to high school, but he put such an emphasis on Barbara getting a degree and her brother. And she now, she married me with a promise that I made, we're going to put, so she finished up the U of R and then she came to work for the school district yeah. as a substitute first. And unfortunately in farming, I got out of farming and started my own company because my heart wasn't in the ranch anymore. I just didn't have it for it. I just, mm -hmm. I, I just didn't. And I honestly don't know in respect, retrospective if I ever really did. Watching the leaves grow and watching the fruit grow was not my idea of fun. I wanted to make things to happen, and, and that's the kind of person I am. But I got real involved in Redlands, and Redlands was just a natural incubator for me to do things. Uh, I was on the Chamber of Commerce Board a couple of times and became a charter member of the Public Works Commission. And I never wanted to run for public office. I felt the real power in the community was not the people who were sitting at the, at the, at the council chamber desks. They were the first people out in the audience. And those were the people who could make the real influence. And I felt I could do my bit. And so we did. And then I was chairman of the Public Works Commission. And I went on the um, what do you want to call it, the Redevelopment Commission, I was on that, and then Bill Cunningham picked me up for the cemetery group, and we started to overhaul that and did a lot of work there and got that straightened around to where, and I was really happy to serve with Harold Hill and Bill. Bill was my high school track coach. Really? And Yeah, and Bill was, I've known him forever. Unfortunately, I see things differently than Bill does as far as the community goes, but that's everybody's right that lives here, and they have a right to do their own thing. But he and Beverly were good to me, and I had a lot of sorry good fathers. Uh, and Rotary. 
You were president of Rotary? Well, yeah. Rotary, I took up Rotary. My father-in-law was a Rotarian and a very active one and loved Rotary. So back in 1970, I joined the Reynolds Noon Club. Mm -hmm. And I was there for three years and I couldn't stand it. Uh, everybody had their place to sit and if you weren't going to sit there, you might get bumped by somebody and I thought, you know, I got a, I got a name on some things around here. Good Lord, I don't want them to revere me, but I ought to have a place to sit once in a while. But that wasn't the real reason. I was very busy trying to run a business, survive. Loggers in Southern California are not very successful because there are no trees to cut. And there's a policy by the Forest Service not to cut any trees for a long time. But I was very good. I got up in the Lake Arrowhead area, and for a while I was a general engineering contractor. And I'm the one who did all the clearing of the village and the burn it down. The resort was mine. I did the clearing of that, with all the trees. In Lake Arrowhead? Arrowhead, and where the resort is now. I, helped, I did all the grading for that. And I've really spent my first real venture in Lake Arrowhead was Papoose Dam, the little, you know where the, the marina is and all that on the east end. There's a little small lake around it that's called Papoose, and it was a seismic developed dam that they had to put there because they were worried about the old dam not being strong enough. And I spent a lot of time in the mountains logging, and I developed and began to develop this little firewood thing just as a, people say, what do you want to do with it? Well, I didn't have time for it, but I would mess with it. I'd send the logs to the mill. Then I started clearing orange groves to develop some machinery. I had done, there's a story out there about what I did. I developed machinery that would give haircuts to trees. Mm -hmm. You've seen them where they're side walled and they're topped. Well, we developed some machinery that would do that mechanically. And it wasn't my idea. I saw it from somebody else, copied it and improved on it. <clears throat> and the same, I developed a machine that would gobble up a whole standing citrus tree in one pass. And I developed some following with that. And things, one thing led to another. But I stuck around in the clearing business, did a lot of great work up until about the early, late 19, well, early eight, 90, 90, 90s, late 80s, it began to die like all development did in a real swoon. And I knew I had to do something else, and I wasn't sure, and, and I was kind of, we really had some hard times then, yes. but I got through them, and then I found out that I had a disease that put me in this chair by the luck of Rotary. I had by then been a president, I had joined my club, and I had become a president of the club, and then a district governor, and then a regional guru type guy. and got to travel around the country representing the president of Rotary and a couple of wonderful trips to Barbara and I took across the country in our little F-150 pickup because the silly Homeland Security thing makes you take every piece of electronic gear and put it in a separate box. Oh. And it was just really, they said, I mean, I looked at the guy one day and I said, you don't want me to fly. Well, we'd rather not. So that was the end of that. So I became a member of the morning club, became president, and uh... I'm going to back you up now. You are in a chair right now, yeah. but you are part of the Redlands Terrier football yeah. legacy. Yeah. In a, you, were, you were one of the, one of the players in, in the, if I'm right, the winningest team of, of yeah. high school's history. Right. Can you talk to me a little bit about those days, of the oh. days for the Long Blue Line? Redlands High School, 1952. Uh, we had a coach named Buck Weaver. And Weaver was the one who brought football to Redlands, winning football or back. We had never for, I don't know how many years as Redlands High School, had any really outstanding records. And he brought it here. And he was one, he was, I call him a Vince Lombardi. Yeah. And because we were all afraid of him. And he looked like him. He just, oh, I mean, but he, we would avoid him by going to the other end, even in the off season. We would walk around the other end of the building to avoid him. Because, and he really wasn't that way. I saw Buck later uh, when he was on his deathbed. And, and, you know, of course, you 
become things when you're going to meet your maker that you're necessarily not going to be when, you, when you're not there. And he, Buck was a very, very um, great coach. Um, and he took us to a championship that year, CBL, and it was our first one, and then on to CIF. And we lost to a school down in Santa Monica. We never were scored upon but once offensively by an offense, another offense. Uh, we never gave up a score defensively. We were kind of like the, the Boston Black Sox, or the no, Chicago Black Sox. And the reason why that year, that team, the seniors, I was a junior, and got to play quite a bit, lettered and all that good stuff. But that team had four Division I scholarships given to it. Unfortunately, those recipients liked to set palm tree fires, and they were caught. And it cost a full scholarship to the academy, a full scholarship to SC, a full scholarship to Oklahoma U, which was the team Bud Wilkinson oh. had come to Redlands to recruit good. this kid, no. who was Sooners. incredible. And one more place in the Northwest, I think it was Washington, Oregon, I'm not sure what school it was. And it was just, it, it, the class was never talked about. Weaver left, uh, he was, stayed with our class, we lost only one game. That was by one touchdown, and that was for the CBL championship. I, that was one loss. We had the one loss the year before, and we had two the year before, four losses in three years of high school football. That's That's remarkable. Stuff. You sure you don't learn how to win, I'll put it that way. Yeah. But you learn how to lose, too. And, and I'll, hey, I'll never forget my senior year. He came in, to He got us all in the old field house, which is up there by the field now beyond the uh, Dodge Stadium, but it's up there. And he got us, you know, he got us all in there and he said, gentlemen, I cost you the game. It's my fault, the coach did. I made a mistake, which he did. We had run up the center. I was one of the guys in the center. We had this, well, we kids were big. In my junior year, the line averaged 255 something. We didn't. The way we worked out was loading orange, orange boxes on the fruit hauling truck. You do five or six hundred of those a day, so that you really develop the guns. So said. Coach said he cost you the game because what, did he give an instruction that was... Well, we had been running up the middle all night long. And if we had fourth and, or third and one or something to go, yeah, we'd blast out there for four or five yards. And yeah. I and two other guys, I mean, we just, we're, we, we called ourselves the bulldozer. Nice. I mean, we'd just go, and we were big, and these, we were playing against Pomona. And I'll never forget it. And came up to the line, and they had pinched everybody in. And God, none of us had the presence of mind say, time out. Yeah. Because we were running around the end or done something else. And we were ahead. They Fourth they, down. Yeah. Okay. They were ahead. They... They ran, they, they stopped us and turned the momentum. You know, high school football is so emotional. I mean, it's 95% of us, not 5% skill. Whereas when you go up the ladder, it gets a lot of skill, but also some emotion. The bottom line was that, that was a great lesson for us, though, and we learned, and you know, hey, it was great. And, but I got a ride out of it, and it was, that was good. And, you know, I'm sorry I couldn't have kept the ride, it would have made a difference, but such as the fates of life, Tony, as you change and do things. But life has been very good to me overall. I mean, when I became involved with Rotary, well, first of all, the good fortune of meeting my soulmate. Yeah. Barbara. Barbara. And having somebody who's just so incredibly kind and gentle and good um, takes a lot of the edges off the old fart. <laughs> but so good. Do you and keep in touch with any of your uh, players, your teammates? In high school? Or yeah. Well, no, from well, RHS? In high school, but not many, but more in college and some in college. And of course, we're going back for the Civil War. We're very proud yeah. of our team this year. 
we're in the top. We haven't been ever undefeated at six, uh, five and zero oh, in 1939 was the last time we went straight to the wins, and we're headed down for number eight. If we get a little lucky, it'd be Washington. We'll be number eight. You're talking about Oregon. Oregon State College and University of Oregon is above us, but that's going to be the Civil War. And I have never, I saw one from the field and then as a spectator when I was there. Oh, I turned around in, in college when I, when I got to be a, when I couldn't play football anymore, I became a, I just, I became a leader. I was a class president and a couple of other things and then just did things, got the military honorary and got involved with that as that I was actually the president of that. I did a lot of things in the leadership lab area that just kind of told me I could do things. And, and, but bottom line was that I really, I really loved the whole idea of Rotary and what it could do. Because I really felt I wanted to help people that I'd never know. The Redland spirit. It's the real spirit of giving. <laughs>